Great. Wow, what a great crowd. Thank you all for coming out tonight to this town hall, special town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders and German Ambassador Peter Wittig. Just want to say a couple quick housekeeping things before we begin. Our host, the Unitarian Universalist Society, asks that there be no food or drinks in the sanctuary with the exception of bottled water. Please, no signs that's against the church rules, and we ask that you kindly respect them. The bathrooms, if you need them, are through the door to the right. There is an accessible bathroom through this door here. After the senator and the ambassador speak, we're going to open it up for discussion. We hope to have a lively discussion. Please, uh, you can come up to two mics here. We ask you to line up. Uh, if you can, please avoid long statements. <laughs> we're here to discuss Germany. We have a very special guest, and we ask that you be respectful of that. And if you are in the balcony, unfortunately, we don't have a mic up there, so you will have to come down to ask a question. With that, now it's my pleasure to introduce German Ambassador to the United States, Peter Wittig, and someone who needs no introduction, our US Senator, Bernie Sanders. Thank you. What a, what a wonderful turnout. Thank you all very much. Uh, for coming out tonight. And let me tell you what the, the purpose of the meeting is. I think that as a nation, we really don't know all that much about what's going on around the rest of the world. Uh, and I think the media does a pretty bad job at that. So what we have uh, here tonight is we have Peter Wittig, and we have been working this, be nice to this guy, we've been working him hard all day long. Uh, as some of you may know, among many other things, uh, one of the areas that Germany is very well known for is their apprenticeship programs. And I have had long concerns that many of our young people who are not going to go to college don't get the kind of training that they need to get the decent paying jobs that are out there. And Germany has done a pretty good job uh, in that regard. Uh, and Peter today met with the uh, governor and with members of the legislature, and then we were in Barrie going to a technical center there to just kind of compare notes and see what we're doing here in Vermont, uh, what they're doing in Germany, and how we can uh, improve uh, what we're doing. Um, tonight, after Peter uh, makes his opening remark, what we'll do is we'll just chat a little bit and I mostly will go any place where people want to go with the questions. I want to focus on social policy in Germany in the sense that I think many Americans are not aware of the kind of paid family uh, leave programs that exist in Germany, not aware of the kind of child care programs that exist, the retirement programs, the health care programs, the fact that public colleges and universities in Germany are tuition free. All right, without further, uh, without further um, to do, let me uh, introduce Peter Wittig. Peter has been a German ambassador to the United States since April 2014, and prior to this, he was German ambassador uh, to the United Nations in New York. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Senator Sanders, um, not only for the kind words, but also for this uh, invitation to come out here to this beautiful state of uh, Vermont. I had been here before with my family uh, skiing, but this is now my first uh, official visit to Burlington. I'm wearing the Green Mountain uh, pin here, <laughs> uh, and it's just uh, great, great to be here. Uh, I, um, this morning when I flew out um, from Washington DC, I was facing uh, one challenge uh, by my daughter. Um, she's, no, she's nine year old. She said, uh, I have to bring back uh, a pint of uh, Chunky Monkey uh, <laughs> from uh, Ben and Jerry's farm. Now I have to figure out how to take this on a plane in a solid form. <laughs> 
I want to um, talk a little bit about um, Germany, my country. Um, Washington has um, had a shutdown issue. Um, my country had a coalition building issue in, in the last uh, month. Uh, it, it took four months after the last election to form a coalition uh, government. But in, in the past um, two days, uh, we've come around and we will have most probably now uh, a government. So, so that sounds uh, pretty complicated. Um, and indeed, um, it is because we have a parliamentary system as opposed to a presidential system, which is binary. And in a parliamentary system, we have um, many parties. We have six parties. And to, in order to form a government, we need a coalition. But the second reason is that um, our mainstream parties, um, center right and center left, have been weakened uh, in the last election. And that's a, a trend in, in, in Europe. We have a fragmentation of the party landscape, and we have now seen, unfortunately, I would say, uh, the emergence of a right-wing populism in Europe and also in my own country. Uh, that party uh, got 12.6% uh, and is now sitting uh, in the opposition um, uh, ranks and makes the whole political uh, life a little bit more uh, difficult. Um, the strengthening of populism in, in, in Europe is a challenge for our democracy that we've got to uh, live with, I guess, in the um, coming uh, years, um, and we've got to tackle that. And uh, basically by looking uh, at the concerns of the people that are behind uh, the rise of, of populism. Now, we have also a good news um, with this new formation uh, of the government. Uh, and uh, that is that the, the country as such is um, uh, doing uh, pretty well. And even with this delay, the country is functioning. Uh, and number one, we have uh, not a change of the whole administration once there's a new election. We have a sort of a permanent civil service. Uh, I'm a uh, non-political civil servant. I'm not a political appointee. So we civil servant keep uh, the shop running, even if there is a new government. In Washington, I think um, some 4,000 people with a new president uh, have to uh, come in for the new job. We don't have that, so there is continuity. And the second thing is we are a federal country, so a lot of the issues that matter to the citizen are um, uh, the authority of the federal states, education, taxation, and this is where they belong, uh, where the problem have to be solved, and, and this sort of strong federalist element also uh, guarantees the stability of the country even if the government changes or has a problem in forming a coalition. And another important, um, I think, piece of good news for, for our country and beyond is that we now have a chance to reform the European Union. Uh, we have an experienced Chancellor uh, Merkel who's been in power for 12 years and we have a new French President, uh, President Macron, a young person with a lot of uh, dynamic and, and a vision. And I think the two leaders will be able to accomplish the necessary reform that Europe needs, especially after Brexit, uh, the UK leaving the European Union. Sometimes in the US, uh, the European Union is perceived as sort of an economic club that is sometimes not performing so well in the American perception. Few people realize that the European Union for us is a peace project. It is a family of nations that guarantee that we will never have war or an armed conflict in our continent, a continent that had been ridden by wars and conflicts over centuries. 
And now we have been living for more than 70 years in peace. Um, it's inconceivable that France and Germany will ever go to war again, and this is thanks uh, to the European Union. So um, uh, we cannot emphasize enough how important the European Union, as complicated as it may be in terms of political architecture, how important that European Union is for our stability, for our peace, and for our prosperity. And I think we have a chance now to move Europe uh, really uh, forward. Um, we, and this new government, um, will be committed to NATO and to the transatlantic alliance. The US is by far our most important ally outside Europe, and we are vigorously loyal to that relationship. Uh, we also remain committed to other um, big goals, like um, fighting climate change and strengthening the Paris Agreement. Uh, that is <laughs> I think that is something uh, I can say about our political culture. Uh, we are a very ecologically minded country. We have a Green Party, but in the last decades, um, you know, uh, ecologically friendly thinking and action has penetrated the whole society. We um, are committed to write quite ambitious climate goals uh, by 2050, a couple of years to go. Carbon emissions uh, should be reduced by 80 to 95 percent uh, relative to the baseline of 1990. So that is basically an ambitious goal to decarbonize our economy over the next uh, decades, and we are firmly uh, committed to that goal. Now, we will also, uh, the government, invest more in education, in research, and in the digital economy, where we are um, have some homework to do in bringing uh, broadband uh, to all of the country, so there is a need to invest there. Another issue that has rattled our society in the past is the issue of refugees and immigration. Um, you might, might know that um, as a result of the civil war in Syria, uh, we have received um, close to a million refugees within a very short period of time in 2015, 2016. <laughs> so most of them came some f from Syria, 15% um, from Iraq, 15% from Afghanistan, and that was a huge challenge that really stretched our organizational capacities, but is much more than just organization providing food and shelter, um, uh, but it's also uh, a, a challenge of integration. And integration is not uh, done uh, in a week or so, it's almost a generational task. And it, it, it is a, as a challenge for the society. In, in our case, um, most of the refugees uh, are coming from Muslim countries that adds a cultural dimension to that immigration, um, to that integration task. So that ha will absorb a lot of financial resources and also um, efforts uh, by the society. Um, it has upended, uh, to a certain extent, our political landscape. I mentioned the right-wing populist party. It's a basically an anti-immigration party. Um, but it, it has also um, had beneficial effects. We are an aging society. Uh, we need immigration. And many of those uh, people, of those refugees are coming, are young people. And you mentioned, Senator, our uh, issue, uh, our um, signature um, program of uh, apprenticeship system. This is something we can also offer to some of the better educated uh, refugees. And they, this is a pathway uh, for them 
into our uh, labor market. Um, now, I close here and say um, our relationship to the U.S. is a very special one. Uh, I would say uh, um, German democracy wouldn't exist uh, in that form without the United States. The United States helped us after the Second World War to become a thriving democracy. Uh, it integrated Germany into the NATO. Um, it helped us to establish a European Union. The United States was instrumental in helping us reunifying the country after the fall of the war. It was a great vision uh, that the people and at that time, uh, the, uh, the administration saw that, you know, the will of the people, a, a peaceful revolution can never be stopped. And they helped us to manage that uh, unification when other neighbors of ours were deeply skeptical what will come out. The U.S. stood beside us, and we will never forget that. So that relationship um, is crucial for us, although uh, we have some challenges now. We have some differences of opinion, like you know, climate policy. But uh, we will work for for that uh, relationship to uh, to continue. And we want to, together with the U.S., try our best to maintain this open, liberal, international order that served us so well in the past, uh, and that guaranteed our prosperity and stability and that is really under stress by a lot of powers in the world. So this is one of my um, passions, uh, do my little part in uh, keeping the relationship with the U.S. as close as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Um, what I want to do is to ask you to kind of describe for us what life in Germany is for uh, an average family. Um, and let me begin, we'll start with, with the birth, birthing process. If I am a, a woman in Germany uh, and I have a baby, what type of maternity leave uh, is available to me? How does that work? Um, there is maternity leave um, six weeks before birth and uh, eight weeks after birth, I believe. And that is paid? That is paid. Um, and my understanding is that uh, after the mother goes back to work uh, or takes family leave for up to three years, she can receive 60% of her pay doing that. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, but it also fathers are eligible if, uh, for, if for instance, um, if the couple decides that the woman should go back to work and the father stay home to look after the child, then parental uh, support um, also can be given um, to the family via the father staying home. Now the United States has the rather dubious distinction of being the only major country on earth uh, not to provide paid family leave. What kind of system uh, do you have in Germany? Um, beyond that, what, what we just described? Um, well, we have uh, maternal leave, parental leave, and then we have a system of um, free uh, early child education of from one year onwards. So every child has a right uh, to be schooled in a, in a pre-K school. Everybody hear that? Yeah. 
Anybody know what um, child care costs in Burlington a year? Anyone have a guess? What's the cost? Well, let me, well, I'll get to the questions later. I just want to stay on child care for a second. It's about 12000 a year, I think. Does that sound right? In the ballpark? All right, and you got free child care after one year? Okay. Um, talk about um, all parents receive a benefit from around $250 per month to help defray the cost of raising children up into the age of 18. What is, what is the purpose of that? Well, everybody gets um, sort of a uh, a child benefit. Um, he goes like this. He says, well, of course, everybody gets a child benefit. Yeah. Well, most of us don't. But uh. So I, I, I have four children. Um, I get about um, 800 euros, which is about, I guess, $900 a month for my, although I, I wouldn't really need it, although I'm not... Um, uh, you know, um, a one percent person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but e e even I, um, even even I um, get that. Every person gets that. Now here's something that is really interesting, and that is the issue of paid vacation and vacation in in general. Uh, as I think many of you know, in the United States there are jobs being advertised that have zero vacation time. Zero. Or maybe people get a week off or they get two weeks off. But we are, maybe with the exception of Japan, the hardest working people uh, in the world. And, and it's really taking a toll on us in terms of stress and the ability to relate to our families. Mr. Ambassador, uh, what kind of vacation time do people in Germany have? I think the legal, um, they are entitled to 20 days, um, everybody. And then it, it goes up with age. And, and, and I think uh, my uh, sort of uh, account uh, is 30 days a year, plus all the holidays. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you discussed uh, living in a nation where childcare is virtually free after one year uh, of age, what happens when kids go to college? Talk about the nature of your college education for a moment. Yeah, this is um, something I get. I guess we are we are proud of. We have um, a tuition-free um, college system. Uh, Ninety-five percent of our universities are public, uh, so um, they are basically free. There is a fee. Um, that amounts up to $250 per semester. That's sort of an administrative fee, but there's no really, um, <laughs> there's no. You know this, the laughter here. People think that that is not an onerous burden <laughs> for going to college. Uh, it's not even a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, universities are financed um, entirely uh, by the state. Um, this is taxpayers' money, um, and um, on top of that, we have um, a support for children from low-income families to cover their cost of lives. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that is, an, um, I think, part of a philosophy in, in, in our tradition. We, we feel that education is a common good that should be financed um, out of uh, the budget of, of, of the state. Um, <laughs> and of course, it's a service for the citizens. But in, in a way, I guess for a society, it really does pay off to have well-qualified citizens that and and broad access to higher education and I think it has contributed to to making us a, a highly industrialized um, uh, mature um, economy uh, so I, I think it is um, of course a service to the citizens but it is it's good for uh, for for the whole Commonwealth say a word about 
health care. Now, as, as you probably know and everybody in the room knows, the United States is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people. You have a somewhat different system than, than other European countries have. Say a word about your system. Is everybody uh, covered? Yeah, we have a, a, a mandatory uh, health insurance, and it goes back to the 19th century. And here again, I think we have a little bit of a, a philosophical um, mindset uh, difference. We come from different traditions. Uh, we, we had a, a rather enlightened um, chancellor in the 19th century called Bismarck. Uh, he was a conservative um, you know, member of the landed aristocracy. Um, he, 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 but I think he had a, a sense of, uh, you know, social responsibility. But he also wanted to keep the socialists down. So what he he uh, basically established uh, an insurance, a, a universal health insurance, and a universal uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, out of the coffers of 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 the state, and and ever since that. We have established this kind of principles of solidarity and redistribution of wealth via uh, the insurance, health insurance, and 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 unemployment insurance. So that debate that uh, the America has or had uh, uh, about health insurance, we we never had really uh, because you don't it think it's a good idea to throw tens of millions of people off of health insurance. Well, in, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I can, can't... Just out of curiosity. Uh, let, no, me, no. let me ask you this. If somebody in Parliament jumps up and you say, I think it's a good idea to throw tens of millions of people off of the health care they had, how would the rest of the country react to that? Yeah, um, it, it would be unconceivable in our country. Um, but I, I, I know... But I also have to add, this country has a different tradition of individualism. And I have a friend in New York um, who would probably say, you know, it all depends on life choices. If you choose not to be insured, it's your, it's your choice. And you, you, you know, I, I think uh, we are coming from a, uh, from a different mindset. And there is a, an individualist uh, tradition in, in this country. And they, it, it, it well, leads I'm not so sense. sure that that's the answer. I think it has. <laughs> but, but the point here, and, Just and try I think to understand. People, I think that it's true not only for Germany. I mean, I think throughout Europe, yeah. the most conservative of the political parties would not think for one moment that health care should not be available to all people as a right. Is, is that broadly uh, correct? I think you're right, yeah. yeah. All right, tell me, stay on health care for a moment. All right. Uh, uh, mom has a baby, goes to the uh, hospital, has her baby. How much does that cost? I wouldn't know. Um, I, my, <laughs> my, my, my wife pro will probably remember. Um, I, I, okay. Honestly, I, don't, I right. don't know. In general, is there much, do, do you have to pay much out of pocket when you go into the doctor? No, we, we, we have an insurance. It's a sort of double... Um, headed uh, insurance. Um, Eighty-six percent of Germans are insured in public insured by via public insurance, publicly financed insurance company companies. They can choose among various, but they're all publicly financed. And then the rest, fourteen percent, chose a private insurance, which does not give you um, much of uh, a difference in treatment, but um, it, it is, um, you pay more, and in, in some cases in hospitals, et cetera, you have more choices. But uh, basically, it's, it's a um, publicly financed health care for all. You have described a pretty generous uh, social welfare uh, system, which uh, obviously costs substantial sums of money, which takes us to the issue of taxation. Tell us a little bit about the nature of your tax system. Well, we have um, federal and 
state and local taxes as well. Our, um, I think, um, tax, the range starts from 14% and the highest is around 48% taxation. Um, we have a tax rate that is higher. I think um, 36% is the tax rate. The US is something in the 20s, 29 uh, or something. Uh, so we, we have higher taxes in, in our country. Um, I, I know most, most people don't like taxes, especially um, Americans don't like tax. <laughs> Uh, I mean, all this welfare state has to be financed, and in our case, it's financed uh, by tax, and, and the tax rate in, in general is, is higher than in the U.S. But you get a lot for those tax dollars, yes? I think we, we, we get a lot, and, and I think I would also claim that our health uh, system has worked well. We spend about 9% um, of the GDP on health. In this country, if I'm not mistaken, it's, a, it's the double, it's almost 18%. Spend about double per capita that you yeah. do. Yeah. All right, there's an issue that in this state uh, people feel strongly about, uh, and that is the issue of the environment and climate change. And I know you've, you've said a few words uh, about that during your remarks. Can you talk a little bit about the nature of the transition of your energy system away from fossil fuel, of what you're doing and where you hope to go. Yeah, that is a very important um, development. Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, we are not blessed by nature like the US. We don't have any substantive um, resources, natural resources in terms of gas and oil. So we have to import our gas and oil um, we used to rely a lot on nuclear energy. We decided, uh, and it was a broad-based support for that decision in the society to phase out uh, nuclear energy. It's, it will be phased out by uh, 2022. We won't have nuclear energy anymore. <laughs> it is a challenge because nuclear energy is clean. So we will have to make up for that uh, if we want to reach our emission goals. Uh, we are betting uh, on renewables, and, and that has become, uh, I guess, an asset also in creating new jobs. Over the last years, uh, the renewable industry, renewable energy industry created uh, 350,000 jobs. Um, so, so that has become a, uh, an asset for our economy. And today, renewables uh, cover one-third of our electricity consumption. And it is supposed to go up because we want to phase out coal as well. We can't do it as quickly as we would like because our energy mix is still dependent on coal. We import gas, uh, we import gas from Russia, we import gas from uh, Norway and from other countries like Algeria, and we will have to diversify our, our import of um, oil and gas, but our main focus is um, to broaden and, and deepen um, the, 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 the renewable energy sector. You have, Germany has been putting a lot of emphasis on solar. So if I own a home and I want to put uh, solar panels, how does that work? Do I get a subsidy from the government? Or? Well, you, you, you get a, a tax break, and then you, um, th those people who, uh, for instance, operate wind mills, they have a guarantee um, for... Uh, they, they get a guaranteed revenue, um, and uh, in a way that uh, revenue is subsidized also by, by the government. Uh, so we, um, um, we, we th this uh, renewable energy focus is, is doesn't come uh, cheaply. It, it is also uh, financed basically 
by higher taxes. But that has, does that have widespread support throughout the country? Yeah, mainstream uh, widespread support by center left, center right, and of course the Green Party. Um, we have seen, getting off domestic policy, um, we have seen the rise of a uh, right-wing party uh, in Germany that got over 12 percent of the vote, double, I think, what they got last election. Um, can you say a little bit about the causation of that? What, why are people uh, voting for a, a right-wing extremist party in Germany? Yeah, it, it is a fallout um, of uh, this refugee and immigration wave uh, that hit us um, in, 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 in a volume and a speed that was unprecedented. Um, it was the biggest movement of people from the Middle East uh, to Europe since the Second World War. We had not seen any anything like that since the Second World War, so it was really a momentous event. And um, this party uh, originally was a small fringe party that was opposed to the euro, the, the common currency of the European Union. And uh, they, they said, we are better off with our old currency, the Deutschmark. They wanted the Deutschmark back. It was sort of a party of some outlier economists, but that morphed into an anti-immigration party with that refugee crisis. So uh, it's, it is now almost a single issue party focused on anti-immigration, and it has galvanized uh, certain other factors or, or currents on the right wing. I would not say it's not a neo-Nazi party. It's, there are some conservatives, uh, some really right-wing populists, and it's sort of a, an assembly also of protest voters. Um, but it is, we've got to take it seriously, 12%. Um, that, that's um, sizable. Um, I assume this right-wing populism will be with us for some time. Uh, I also think that is, this is a serious challenge to our liberal uh, democratic order in Europe. Um, I would even go so far to say the Western democracies are being challenged by um, right-wing populism, and, and I think we've got to um, deal with the issues that are underlying. You mentioned, if I heard you correctly, that there, there have been a million refugees coming in in, in the last uh, several years, is that correct? No, we had a million uh, within a couple of months. A couple of um, months? Yeah. Wow. from from September 2015 to March 2016. We had sometimes, we had uh, 10,000 a day um, coming in. Um, in, in and, and that was just overwhelming. So these are people who probably cannot speak German. Many of them will be of a different religion, yeah? Yeah. How are you, and that's, that's just an incredible number of people coming in in a very short period of time. What are you trying to do to integrate them into German society? Well, two things are of primordial importance. Get them in the labor market as soon as possible. Um, and then uh, train them in, in, in German. Give them, offer them language courses. And, and one is related to the other. So what we did is uh, we offered, um, I think, around 500,000 last year, or in 2016, we offered 500,000 immigrants and refugees a language course. We employed, I think, 35,000 additional teachers to teach them in, in, in German so that they have a rudimentary uh, command of the, uh, of, of, of the language in order to get them into the labor market. So that's the, the pathway. Um, and and uh, I think 20% of all businesses are now employing refugees. Uh, of course, you know, the government appealed to them. And we have success stories. And uh, we also have stories where there's no success. Uh, and, and it is 
in, in a way, uh, a, a, a divisive issue because uh, s some people in our country believe that it will be almost next to impossible to integrate all of them uh, c coming from, from a, um, a very different culture. So it is, a, it is a real issue fueling this kind of anti-immigration party and, and, and it will probably take um, a couple of years to digest that. Um, but I also have to say, um, we th th this is a signature of the time. Uh, there are 65 million people in the world on the move. Europe is in the neighborhood of North Africa and the Middle East. The Middle East is in flames. North Africa is full of fragile states. So that is something that we've got to deal with. And most people in, in, in Europe and also in Germany are determined now to say we can't take any more and we have to make our borders uh, more resilient and, and we've got to do more um, repatriation of those who are not really refugees in the sense of victims of war or persecution, but just economic migrants. And I think they have a point. We cannot offer uh, a job to anybody who wants to live in our country, uh, but we have to focus on those who are really fleeing a war, a civil war, or have humanitarian reasons uh, to come. And, 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 and that's something I think that uh, also politicians have to take seriously. The, the triage, the separation of those who have a real need to be protected and those who are understandably, but uh, not legitimately, um, try to um, get, a, get a job. And we can't give jobs to anybody. My last question, and we can open it up, is the role of trade unions uh, in Germany. Trade unions are much more uh, powerful, and a much higher percentage of workers belong to unions. And you also have a situation, which I think is really interesting, that in large corporations, at least, you have workers' councils. Workers have representation on basic decision-making. Uh, can you say a word about that? Well, we have mandatory workers' council. Uh, that's... Uh, by law, and um, then we have another um, concept that's called the co-determination. The big companies, um, w representatives of workers, mostly unions, but it could also be independent re representative of, of workers have to sit in the boards of, of half, half of them are sitting in the boards of big companies. So th that's the concept of uh, what do you mean, half of them, you mean half of the borders? Yeah. Half of the boards of the large of the corporations are workers? Is, yeah. Um, and uh, that, well, you have to understand, that's the tradition. And that's, uh, I, I think, also a result of, of, of the war, Second World War. Wars are always the biggest equalizers. And, and, and the idea was to create a socially um, responsible market economy. And that was the idea of the founding fathers and mothers of our um, republic after the Second World War. We didn't just want to have sort of capitalism pure, but we wanted to have a social responsible capitalism. And this concept to have a participation of workers um, in in the in the businesses and a co we call it co determination in the boards of the big companies th that there's that is a result of that philosophy. So representatives of workers will be involved in all major decision making of major corporations. Well, they are in the boards. They're they're they are not sort of in the management of of the companies, but they are in the boards overseeing the management and mostly. It's union representatives, uh, but not, it, it doesn't have to be so, but because those union representatives are full-time board members, they, they have to sort of, uh, uh, you know, devoting all their time to board, um, uh, board affairs. So that, that, that's, I think, I guess it's pretty unique, but this is part of the tradition in Germany. Okay. Um. 
Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Now let's open it up. Uh, <laughs> We got a mic here. We have a mic here. If you can make your questions brief, that would be much appreciated. My name is Madeline Winterfalcon. I live in Moncton, and um, I want to make a short, very short statement about health insurance. I am now on Social Security. Yeah. Okay. Social Security and Medicare, and I worked for almost 50 years in a middle-class office position. Um, with good insurance and decent salary. And now, as I'm aging, things are getting really bad. Um, my partner works part-time, and I work also very part-time. And we make just about this much, too much money to get any assistance with particularly our prescriptions. Um, I just found out the other day that the copay on my insulin is now $45 a vial, a vial. It used to be $9 for a three month supply. And all of a sudden this has changed and I don't know how I'm gonna pay for it. Um, and I never thought that I would be in this position um, that things are getting way more expensive as I'm having less and less income. So I, I, it's just something I wanted to put out there. Let me say this to you and to anybody else who's has similar problems. I don't know what my office can do, but please give us a ring. Okay, I'll do that. There may be programs out there that we can help you with. Okay. But um, let me just say this, taking that question. Everybody hear the question about the high price of, of insulin and, and the problems with health care. Uh, talk a little bit about prescription drugs. Do you have familiarity with the issue? Uh, in Germany, uh, the very same medicine that we buy in this country is uh, far, far less expensive. Why is that, do you think? Um, I'm not so sure whether I can answer that question. Um, it's probably a different kind of regulation. Um, and uh, probably we have a corridor of um, pricing of, of medicine. Right. Well, we remain. I mean, we have the totally absurd situation that right now, uh, and insulin is a perfect example, and I think the guy, is that an Eli Lilly product yes, that you get? Yes, it is. Well, you'd be happy to know, and I say this you know, painfully, that that particular fellow who raised the price of insulin yeah. is now the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Oh, I know that. <laughs> uh, and right now in this country, unbelievably, and again, this is something that I think in Europe people could not believe, uh, the drug companies can raise their prices for any reason, to any level that they can, and they will, and that's what they do. And we end up paying probably twice as much uh, for the same exact drugs uh, as are sold in, in, in Germany or in, in Canada or in France. And this is a major, major, major issue. And I, you know, we're working night and day in a variety of ways because this, in the midst of a dysfunctional healthcare system, the high cost of the prescription drugs is just an outrage, and so many people just cannot afford the medicine they desperately need. But thank you very much for coming up. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. My name is uh, Diane Muller. My name's Diane Miller, and some of my relatives come from the area of Dawn, Germany. And I was wondering, since we started off talking about cooperating, I've been trying to find out about what community is like there. And I was wondering if you could give a really brief like two sentence explanation of what these collective municipalities are that are in that area, if you could. The, the, the collective municipalities? Yeah, we don't have that here, I don't think. Uh, well, g g can you give me an, an example? Well, of? like Gillenfeld and um, Eckfeld and Laufeld and all these things, they're all part of this collective arrangement together where they, these little tiny villages all band together to, um, for their welfare and for their governance, I guess, but that's all I know from this far away, and I'm wondering if you know any more about it, that's all. <laughs> I fear I don't know much about that. That, that is uh, sort of municipal <laughs> affairs. Um, I've been away for eight years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, ma'am. I like that question. Um, I'm gonna read it from here because I typed a thingy. 
So I feel like the burden of assimilation being placed completely on refugees is a little bit unfair seeing as they've just been displaced from their homes. I was curious as to if there are any educational or job retraining efforts that are geared towards German citizens to um, kind of get them more familiar with the culture of all of these individuals coming in since so many of them seem to be coming from the same area or if there are also like educational things reminding them of the fact that your population is declining and immigration is important in Germany. What was the question? I think the question <laughs> No, it's a good question, and the question is assimilation, and what is Germany doing uh, to make uh, refugees integrated uh, culturally and, and, and work-wise? Yeah, kind of. Uh, it, it was like, what, is, what is Germany doing not specifically with those refugee populations, because I understand you have like job retraining and language courses for them, but like for German people. Oh, is for the there, German people. Yeah. Okay, all right. So what kind of educational efforts take place uh, with the German population to allow them to better understand uh, the nature of the refugees and make them feel more welcome? Well, I guess it comes with a problem. You know, um, if you have all of a sudden in a school in Berlin, 40% um, kids that are kids of refugees, uh, the other kids, the 60% uh, Germans, they will be wanting to know where are they coming from, what is their religion, uh, what makes them come here, which kind of war did they flee, and I think then the teachers are called upon to, to explain that to them. I mean, there are no sort of education programs world, uh, you know, nationwide, um, what is Syria and what is Islam, uh, but I think it comes with a problem, and, and we have a a huge discussion now about um, is there a need for a kind of European Islam, mm -hmm. a kind of sort of moderate um, Islam that is compatible with our values, with let's say the gender um, uh, values that we have, the respect for women, et cetera, the veils, that, that, that all is now an issue. And I think, so it was, it, it is a kind of education with a problem. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am? My name's Robin Lloyd, and thank you, uh, Ambassador, for coming here. Um, I know you have a robust uh, peace movement in your country, both against nuclear uh, power and, um, and I understand, uh, in some cases, you're asking our um, our uh, bases to uh, leave. Um, and so uh, I want you to know we have a peace movement here, and we're very concerned about the F-35 airplanes at our airport, which is which are unfortunately supported by all of our um, political elite here. Uh, could you say? what the attitude of Germany is to these bombers? Are you buying uh, a bunch of them? And if so, what for? No, I'm, uh, I, I can't uh, comment on that. I really don't know enough about this. Uh, I can only tell you, yes, there is a peace movement uh, in Germany and that has had a long tradition. Um, uh, but I think most people believe that we are living in a world that is um, under stress, uh, that is in our neighborhood in disarray. We have m challenges emanating from Russia. Um, and uh, so there is a need of defense. I think that is mainstream position. And uh, we need to beef up our, our defense if, if we, for instance, look at the challenges from the Middle East, um, those countries that uh, are hit by terrorism, uh, those are legitimate issues, and I, uh, I respect the peace movement in, in, in our country, but at the same time, I think most citizens would say um, this is not the time uh, to uh, relax on, on defense, but the world has become a more dangerous world, and. And, and, and defense and defense spending is something legitimate. Uh, that, that is what probably most citizens would say. Sir? It's a question for both of you uh, to answer separately. Peter, is Germany now 
on track and Bernie is America on track to possibly diminish or even lose your respective and our respective systems of representative democracy. And Peter, Germany lost its democracy back in the late 20s and early 30s. And could you spell out the kind of things that happened to cause that to be lost? And Bernie and Peter, could you both speak to your, not the things that need to happen to preserve it, but the plans to actually let us fix these things to avoid that result? Thank you for that question. I am uh, not uh, worried about um, representative democracy uh, being uh, abolished or uh, substituted by an authoritarian rule. I don't see that emanating. But um, we are, um, in a way, uh, faced with a situation where populism, mostly from the right, is disturbing the political consensus and is uh, resorting to methods that uh, poison uh, our civilized political discussion. I'm not, we are not at, at, a, at a stage where uh, we should fear sort of authoritarian leaders, and speaking here of Europe, authoritarian leaders uh, emerging. This is not the 20s or the 30s. On the other hand, we should not be complacent. Democracy has to be defended every day. The right of the press has to be defended. The right of the opposition to speak out. Uh, nobody should be bullied. The institutions that provide the checks and balances have to be respected, etc. Um, and and I'm not I'm not uh, pessimistic that um, we cannot defend our democracy, but um, there are challenges from populism in, in our continent, and 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 I think the only way to sustainably uh, weather this storm is uh, identify the issues that um, people are moved by. Uh, and what, what attracts them to populism. And those are sometimes social issues, social grievances, sometimes they're economic grievances, some, some, sometimes they are identity grievances. And that's different in, 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 in different countries. You ask a, uh, where'd you go? Oh, okay. You ask a very important question. Uh, and um, especially with Trump uh, in the White House, I am very, very worried about the drift toward authoritarianism. Uh, when you have a president, I don't mean to be overly uh, political here, I think you all know my views. <laughs> but when you have a president, I mean, it's one thing to have a conservative, and I, you know, we dis I disagree very strongly, but you have a president who's a pathological liar. And I say that not just... <laughs> and I say that not just, you know, as, as a political statement, it undermines democracy if you have a president who increasingly people can't believe a word that he says. He is intentionally lying, and there is a reason for that. And you have a president, whenever anybody in the media criticizes him, says that's all fake news, it's all a lie. And you have a president who attacks, you know, people, presidents always disagree with uh, decisions coming from the judiciary, uh, and they may appeal them but you don't attack the independence of the judiciary, you know, an independent branch of government. You got a, you know, you got a president who just the other day, I mean, it gets, it never ends, you know, suggests that people like me who were at the State of the Union speech who did not think every word that he says was brilliant and deserved to a standing ovation uh, we are being attacked as, as treasonous, treasonous, that's a heavy duty word. Um, and if you go deeper than that, you find that uh, for a lot of reasons, and you know, Peter discussed some of them, uh, a lot of people do not have a lot of respect or faith for democracy. You have elections where half the people don't vote. Uh, you have a political system today where the Koch brothers in this coming election will spend $400 million to elect right-wing extremists. Um, 
So what I am spending a lot of my time on is what we call revitalizing American democracy in every way that we can, getting people to stand up, to fight back, to run for office. Uh, and we're having success at that all over this country. A lot of young people now, for the first time, are getting involved in politics uh, and running for office. But I share that concern. I don't think that the fabric of democracy in this country is as strong as I would like to see it. Uh, on my office, uh, we have a painting. Who's that guy from Arlington? Um, who's the painter? Rockwell. Who? Norman Rockwell. And I have the painting of that uh, scene. It was a town meeting in Arlington, Vermont. You remember that? A guy was up speaking at a town meeting, and I believe in that. I worry about that very much. So I would say, at the, to me, where we are right now, there are two key issues that I worry about. Number one, oligarchy and the fact that we have fewer and fewer people controlling the economic and political life of the country. And number two, not unrelated, is this drift toward authoritarianism. You have the president just the other day saying, my goodness, wouldn't it be wonderful if we spent tens and tens of millions of dollars on a military parade? <laughs> so he could stand up there like they did in the old Soviet Union. Well, I don't know what they did. You know, it, it, you know, it is you know, really quite unthinkable. So I would say that I am less concerned about your political views than I am about the need to revitalize democracy, get people involved in the process, defend democracy. You remember what Abraham Lincoln said? A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And man, we have to fight hard uh, to preserve that. Yes. My, my name is Bob Roberts. I'm from St. Albans Bay, and uh, I, I've been here probably about 15 or so years. But I taught college in Michigan for many years, and there was a program there where the German Bundestag and the U.S. Congress brought young uh, factory workers, and they were in our college for one year, and then we sent some of our young factory workers. Is that program still going on? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you for that question. It's a supremely successful program. It's one of the best programs uh, we have uh, in exchange. And uh, there was a danger at a certain point in time uh, that the funds for that program would be cut. But both Congress and the German Bundestag fought hard. And in the end, that decision was reversed. I cannot emphasize enough how important those people-to-people -people exchanges are. I mean, so many German uh, young kids um, have spent a year in, a, in, a, in an American high school, and um, less Americans have spent time in, in Europe. Uh, but you know, whoever has spent time here as a young man or a young woman will never be the same. And we will all be enthusiastic for a great relationship with each other. So I, I, I'm a great fan of those programs. Our last student that we had was Lutz, and he came from East Germany. He wasn't speaking English when he came. And uh, in the year that he was there, he transformed, and he was a wonderful person to see. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. OK, let me. I don't know, I don't know that we're going to be able to get to everybody online, but that, those should be the last people online. OK, no. OK, uh, ma'am. Hi, uh, I admire both of you greatly, and I absolutely love the country of Germany. Um, I think American citizens are feeling increasingly helpless and hopeless in the ability to enact political change. So my question is, what do you recommend citizens do to provide progress to some of the social policies we mentioned, um, especially in the face of our current administration? Who's that question addressed to? That's both a question to Senator Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, these are unprecedented times uh, in American history. And we have to act and react in an unprecedented way. Uh, so I spend half of my life right now uh, doing everything that I can 
uh, to get people to stand up and to fight back. Uh, I think we got to do two things. Number one, we have to take Trump on every day in terms of his racism and his sexism and his homophobia. But that's not enough. The other thing that we have got to do is have a progressive vision that has the American people ask why. Now, the truth is, Germany is not the most progressive country in the world. What Germany is doing, virtually every other country, more or less, in terms of your social programs, does the same, more or less. Yes? No? All right, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, Denmark, for example, would go further in many of these programs than Germany, I suspect. Yeah? I'm getting a reluctant yes there. All right. <laughs> but the reason you know, that we do things like bring Peter here is in Germany, everything that he said, of course everybody is entitled to health care is a right. Of course when you have a baby, you have the right to stay home and nurture. Of course the husband has a right. Of course you have the right to go to college, tuition free. All of those things throughout many countries in the world is, of course, how can anyone debate that? But for a variety of reasons in this country, having a lot to do with corporate control over the media, having a lot to do with you know, two fairly, well, you know, one right-wing party and one moderate party, these issues are not being brought up in America. So one of the things we have got to do is ask simple questions. How does it happen in our very great country? We're the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people. What Peter was talking about is not particularly radical. 50 miles away from us in Canada, they got health care. We spend twice as much for prescription drugs as they do in Germany. Why? Because they regulate the price. Not a radical idea. 80% of the American people support that. Overwhelming support for making public colleges and universities tuition free. But you got a political system which is corrupt, which is dominated. Can you imagine, and maybe Peter, you want to say a word on this, your election system. We are going to see hundreds of millions of dollars coming in. You're going to see it on your TV sets. Ugly ads coming from the second wealthiest family in America. One family, the Koch brothers, spending hundreds of millions of dollars. We got to stand up. We got to change stuff. We got to talk about public funding of elections. And on that subject, Peter, we talked about this at dinner. Say a few words about the differences between the German election system, if you like, and the American system. But the bottom line is stand up, fight back, have a vision of where you want this country to go in the future. Thank you. Well, I, I, I don't want to convey the image of uh, chest thumbing here and self-congratulationary discourses that everything is better in our country. Uh, it, it's not. Um, and, and I'm aware that we're coming from very, very different traditions. And in our country, um, we, the, the role of finance, of money in politics is smaller, a lot smaller than in this country. Now, I'm, I'm not um, giving grades here, and, and I'm just describing. Um, we have an election cycle of four years. We uh, uh, vote every four years. Uh, that means we don't have that permanent election campaign uh, due to the two-year cycle in the House. Um, and we have also, you know, Germans like to regulate. <laughs> we always also have um, a kind of regulation on how much money can go to politicians and to parties, and that's um, <laughs> but that's the that's the tradition. And I'm not saying that I want to export that model worldwide, but but it's just a fact that we don't have that tradition. And I think most Germans like it that way. Uh, that uh, money. Uh, has a small role in, in, in the elections, but of course I don't pronounce a judgment on, on this country. Uh, sir. Uh, I have a specific question about a piece of legislation in regards to uh, taxes and a living wage. Uh, last summer, Congressman Ro Khanna from Silicon Valley in California introduced the Corporate Responsibility and Taxpayer Protection Act. This is a bill that would make large corporations not the taxpayer pay for costs of federal programs that low-wage employers rely on to make ends meet, such as nutrition. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just trying to be quick. I, uh, 
I'm so I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm nervous. Use your okay. words. Okay. Um, the Corporate Responsibility and Taxpayer Protection Act is a, bill, is a bill that would make large corporations, not the taxpayer, pay for costs of federal programs such as that low-wage employers rely on to make ends meet, such as nutrition, medical, and housing assistance. Low wages end up costing taxpayers $153 billion per year. Why not give corporations an ultimatum, either pay your employees fairly or pick up the tax bill? I think this is a bill... So um, is this something you would support, this of piece course, of? Of course, of course. I mean, we talked about this. The answer is yes. And here's your point. This is the absurdity. The absurdity is, as an example, you got Walmart, which is owned by the wealthiest family in America, the Walton family. They are the wealthiest family in America. But what your point is about is they pay wages that are so low that many of the Walmart employees are on food stamps or on Medicaid or subsidized housing. So in other words, because the Walton family, the wealthiest family, pays wages so low, you are paying higher taxes and essentially subsidizing them. It is clearly, I mean, this is corporate welfare at the, at the worst. So our job is to tell every corporation in this country, pay your workers a living wage. We don't want to subsidize you. Absolutely. Senator Sanders, uh, at the beginning of the night, you said something about internships, specifically that in Germany they're treated differently than here. Um, having interned in France, I can't say anything about the German system, though I imagine they're similar. Ambassador, you can elaborate if you want. Um, but uh, my experience in France was that they have very, very stringent rules against exploitation of students by corporations. And they've had these rules since Napoleon. So it's, again, a tradition. Um, <laughs> but is there any future for that kind of, you know, it, specifically they have forced paid internships, Absolutely. no unpaid internships? You know, it's, it, thank you for asking that. Um, the internships in the Congress, as a matter of fact, uh, and throughout America, what they say is, listen, we're going to give you the opportunity to work for a company or work for a congressperson, and you're going to get good experience, but we're not going to pay you anything. Well, if you're a working class young person, you can't take that opportunity. You need a paycheck. So your point is well taken, and I'm happy to tell you that I believe my office is the first office, not only, well, the other offices have paid uh, their interns, but we pay them $15 an hour. Your point is well taken. Good evening, Senator Sanders and Ambassador. Um, my name is Teresa McDonough, um, and the question I have is kind of more specific to my situation and life story. Um, my husband, in the last... Uh, year or so and his brothers are now taking advantage of their eligibility for dual citizenship of Germany, which I think is really awesome. Um, obviously him and his mother were not, well his mother was born there but she did not grow up there so a lot of the knowledge of Germany's system is not kind of inherently passed down to us. Um, and me and my husband are actually expecting our first child this summer. Uh, <laughs> And unfortunately, um, me and my husband both grew up in Vermont, and as we're thinking f toward the future and her future, um, you know, we have $150,000 in student loan debt combined. <laughs> um, and just the state of our healthcare system and the state of our government, we want to be able to make, you know, her eligible for citizenship. So m my question is, do we have to do anything going forward? Um, is there anything as far as living there that we would have to kind of plan ahead to make her eligible for health care or for the free tuition that you know the citizens of that country get so that we could set her up properly in the future? Are you, are you talking about your, your future child? Yeah, our daughter. Yeah. She would be eligible for dual citizenship through my husband's family. 
Um, I'm not too sure what the path to citizenship is in this particular case. Yep. Usually, um, if if the two parents are German, of mm -hmm. course, then the child is German. If only one um, part is German, the other is American, um, then I think um, it, it depends a little bit on uh, where you live. Yep. And there might be a path to citizenship uh, once your child is, is older. Yep. I, I, I just don't know the legal situation um, uh, in, in this specific case. Uh, but, uh, of, of course, you're eligible um, to, to live in Germany and to send your uh, child, um, you know, when the time comes, uh, tuition-free to uh, the university there. And uh, I, I'm sure if one uh, part of the couple is, has the German nationality, that eventually there is a path uh, to the German citizenship. I just don't know the timelines yeah. and the requirements for um, having to live there a while. I, 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 I can promise you a more precise um, information if you leave me with your address and I can email you that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm over here, uh, Bernie, talking to a woman who works with you at the office, and I, actually I confessed, I said, all I, all I really wanted to do is ask a question that would get you up and active in front of the, the group, and, and holding forth in the way that you are, so we thank you. My name is Bob Buchanan, I teach at Goddard College. One of the issues that I haven't seen emerge that I know a lot of us are thinking about very deeply is the extraordinary racism and white supremacy that is all over the White House and is deeply in, insinuating into the Republican Party. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can build as a community here in Vermont and across New England and across the country, and specifically in regard to the vulnerable status, not merely the darkest people, but of course the Haitians, the El Salvadorans, the people of color all over that are really being facing the racism and the aggression of the Trump administration. I mean, I think one of the ugliest aspects of the Trump administration is his effort to divide us up. Every president, no matter how conservative they might have been, whether it's you know, Reagan or, or George W. Bush, understands that a fundamental job of the presidency is to try to bring people together, not to divide them up. And he is very intentionally, for political reasons, appealing to a minority of Americans to a, a racist base uh, trying to divide us up. So I think right now, uh, in that regard, and I, I would hope people pay attention to this, uh, we are at a monumental moment uh, in terms of 800,000 young people uh, who are uh, in the DACA program right now, uh, who have, in some cases, come to this country at the age of one or two, know no other country. And if we don't get our act together in the Congress Literally within the next couple of weeks, these 800,000 young people, many of whom are working or in school or in the military, they're going to be subjected to deportation. That's where we are right now. So the immediate task, and I've been working really hard on this, uh, is to do everything that we can to pass a Dreamers Act, to stand with these young people, and to stand with people all across this country, whether they're black or whether they're gay, or whether they're transgender, people who this administration, for ugly political reasons, uh, are going after. We have got to stand with those people who are under attack. Thank you. Hi. My name is Claudia Becker. Um, I grew up in Germany in the 70s and 80s. I came to Vermont in the early 90s. Um, I benefited from a lot of the um, institutions and implementations of the social democracy at that time. Um, I feel like Germany has changed a lot, and the things that you're speaking about today are still true, but they, do have, they did change quite a bit over the last 25 years. Germany has become more competitive in the European Union. It has dismantled a lot of the um, benefits that used to be true for somebody like me growing up in a different generation. Uh, Poverty is on the rise in Germany. My question is, and this links a little bit to the, uh, your initial comment to the new coalition. I know that the young people in the SPD were really not very fond of the coalition because they wanted to 
be the opposition. They wanted to be more progressive. They wanted to see more of a commitment to the social democratic values and not move towards the center and not move towards the more neoliberal um, agendas of the center. Uh, my question to you is, uh, as an example that we all look to, you know, from here, from this perspective as a country that has so much to offer when it comes to social institutions, um, how committed do you think Germany still is to those true values of social democracy which have been dismantled, workers' rights, health care, all these things have been whittled away over the course of time. How committed do you think Germany still is and where do you see the future of the true social democratic values of the country? Um, I'm not too sure whether I agree with you when you say all those rights have been dismantled. I think uh, the, uh, the welfare benefits have rather been beefed up and this government Ha has agreed, I mean, that is sort of in the, in the making, uh, has agreed to even uh, be more generous in certain uh, welfare benefits, and that has been, I think, uh, the success of a good negotiation by the Social Democrats in, in, in that coalition talks. Uh, you're right that there is sort of a, a left wing of the Social Democrats that is opposed to to this coalition with a center-right party. The Social Democrats have um, uh, had to endure the worst defeat in the last elections in their history. So they originally thought they want to go into opposition to reinvigorate themselves, to re-emerge as a uh, strong uh, social uh, center-left party. Uh, they are now faced with the obligation uh, for uh, sort of the common good to enter into that coalition because there's no alternative here. Um, and that is a split in the party. And that's why this party will have a referendum uh, in a couple of weeks whether they accept this coalition agreement and whether in the end the party will endorse going into the um, uh, government. Now, uh, that's an open question. But I agree with you, sort of the young socialists, uh, they are more to the left and they will probably oppose. I think the, 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 the conventional wisdom is right now that the majority of the party will uh, vote in favor of forming that coalition. I, it is not a, I would say, an ideal configuration, this grand coalition. It would have been, would be a little bit like uh, the Republicans and the Democrats uh, in, in one government, in one coalition. Uh, that's well, that would be fun. Uh, yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> so, um, but we are a more consensual democracy than others. Uh, I think the Germans are probably happy with that middle ground that... Uh, I think that, that is part of why populism is on the rise? I, I, I think you're right. I mean, if you do this f over a sustained period, Austria had this for, for decades almost. You know, the two major parties forming a coalition, it strengthens uh, the fringes. It, it should not be a permanent state. But in, in now, with this populist party emerging, there is little other alternative right now than the two mainstream parties forming a coalition. But it will um, elicit some, some opposition, but that's normal in a democracy. Um, I see about 20 people online, and we're not going to get to everybody. So I apologize. Could we cut it off at about one, two, three, four? One, two, three, four. Okay? So I apologize, but it's getting a little bit late. Okay. Yes. Hello. Um, this is primarily like a question for Ambassador Wittig. Um, get closer to the mic there, please. Okay. Sorry. This is a question primarily for Ambassador Wittig. Um, in the U.S., we heavily emphasize college, and if you don't go to college, we kind of... I don't want to say abandoned, but that's basically what we do. Um, in Germany, I know you guys have apprenticeships and um, trade schools, and I would just like to know a bit more about how that's an alternative to going to university in Germany. Yes, um, that's what we, um, that we discussed extensively during the day. Thank you for that question. Yeah, we have um, a um, very popular and um, sort of tested system of uh, dual vocational training, or 
otherwise called the apprenticeship. Um, that's an alternative to college. People, uh, young students, young high school students, we have a, a system where people can leave the high school after ninth grade or 10th grade or after high school graduation. So students of, let's say, 16 years of age can start an apprenticeship. This is usually taking two or three years. 70% of the time is spent in a company. Uh, they earn money uh, uh, around $1,000 a month and they're being trained in practical skills in that company. 30% of the time is spent in a vocational school that sort of teaches them other skills like accounting, etc. And after two or three years, there is an exam according to very well set standards in that particular profession. And there, uh, you, you, you find apprenticeship um, systems in 330 different occupations or pro professions with a specific curriculum. So after two or three years, you take an exam and then you have a certificate as um, you know, a trained, and then comes the name of this particular pr profession. That's a certificate that takes you quite a long way. It's a recognized certificate, a recognized exam a non-college, but yet socially very well regarded um, um, exam that is the pathway for most of those apprenticeship into a practical job, a money-making, rather well-paying job. 70% of those apprenticeship, apprentices that have undergone an apprenticeship in a company then stay with a company. So it is for the companies a way to recruit people and create a loyalty and sometimes it's a lifelong loyalty of relationship with that company. It has been a very successful model. It has brought down youth unemployment to a record low level. It's, we have the lowest youth unemployment in the Western world. And this is also a kind of recipe for the success of our manufacturing industry because it relies largely on those skilled labor. And, and the important thing is that um, we offer an alternative for young um, men and women that like to do practical things early in life and like to come into the labor market early in their life. And that's a good um, alternative to, to, to the college education. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Patrick Granham. I just wanted to ask the ambassador about relations between Germany and Turkey. Um, you already have what in the Islamic world is seen as a moderate Islamic population for a very long time. But relationships between Germany and Turkey have been strained a lot in the last few years. And the second question, just very quickly, was Germany seems to be able to um, more quickly set up new political parties to take these tensions. And here in America, we, we don't seem to be able to do that. I'd love, Bernie, for you to talk about the possibility of a third party and um, what, why, what would stop you from setting up a third party? Um, on Turkey, great question. We, we are in a very difficult phase of our relationship to Turkey. Um, Turkey is moving towards a more Islamist society under the leadership of President Erdogan. Uh, we have about three million uh, Turkish uh, or citizens or residents with Turkish heritage. Uh, sort of, it's, it's a strong minority of um, Turks that became Germans or are residents. So we have um, stakes in that relationship with Turkey. Uh, it's a NATO member. It's a, a very important NATO member. It's sort of the linchpin to the Middle East and to the Caucasus, uh, very close to, to, to Russia. Um, we want to be careful in, on the one hand, not to lose our bonds. Um, we had accession negotiations with Turkey to bring them in 
to the European Union. That's a far cry for the moment. But we want to maintain the bonds, especially not to discourage the civil society in Turkey. There's a vibrant civil society, including in opposition uh, to Turkey. So we want to keep that uh, tie to the Turkish society. And um, we just hope uh, that uh, um, <coughs> Erdogan is not moving Turkey far away from the model of a, of a liberal representative democracy. Uh, there is a really a danger of uh, authoritarian tendencies in, in this country. So in a nutshell, a difficult relationship. Uh, we're not giving up on Turkey. We try to foster the human bonds, um, but it requires uh, statecraft, really, and a, a lot of prudence in, in, in managing this relationship. Um, now, the third party, we have a third party. We, ha we, we even have six parties in, in our uh, <coughs> parliament. Uh, this is a, a, a basically a problem of a presidential uh, system where that tends to be binary and where, uh, as, as I learned, uh, third party candidates never succeeded. Uh, but it. it, it well, th actually, in this city, they did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> city and state. <laughs> I'll just briefly answer it. It's ironic because Earhart's online, and Earhart has been part of that coalition. I served on the city council when I was mayor. Um, you know, there are communities all over this country where, for good reasons, people feel dissatisfied with the Republicans and they're satisfied with the Democrats and they're moving in an independent way. And that's fine. Uh, I happen to believe that at the national level right now, uh, getting back to the points we talked about a moment ago about the fragility of American democracy, I think it is absolutely imperative that we come together, not divide ourselves up, and defeat Trump and defeat the right-wing Republicans who now control the United States Congress. So that is my focus of attention right now. Hey, uh, um, on top of the educational system uh, with matters um, on immigration, um, what stance does Germany hold that allows for a greater integration through, uh, of immigration for um, different cultures to be more accepting of the mass influx of new citizens that are coming into Germany. Um, then my response, or, and then the second question is, what do you think America, uh, what elements are we missing that we can implement that might um, bring America a little bit more together, making immigrants feel more like American citizens? Well, um, I would be hesitant to give any recommendation to um, America. Uh, because as a diplomat, uh, I would um, step on thin ice here because uh, <laughs> it usually <laughs> means taking sides, and I've got to be very careful with this. Um, but I, you know, what we admire, um, have always admired with, uh, with America, is that this is a country of Im immigrants, and you somehow managed um, with an unprecedented sense of attraction and patriotism to integrate uh, those uh, immigrants. And this, this is unique in the world, if you will. Um, you, you have uh, people from 150 different cultures and languages, even more, and after a while, they all feel like uh, true diehard Americans. And, and so there must be a, a magic trick here how um, this country, at least in the past, elicited this sense of American patriotism. I think that's a miracle, but you, you, you did it. And this is, this is the American exceptional. Uh, and we, we try to learn from this. What you did, um, and I think the, the recipe for us is to to have a, a culture of acceptance of immigrants. I mean, you have to have an open heart, an open mind. Uh, of course, that's easier said than done, 
but, but it's, it's a mindset issue, uh, also in our case. And we've got to work on that because, as I said before, we need immigration. We're an aging society. And if we want to sustain our standard of living, we need it. So in this sense, we, I think we, we can learn a lot of, of, from America. I, I agree with what Peter said. And, and I would just add that for me, it becomes a little bit of a personal issue. I guess my father came to this country uh, without a nickel in his pocket, coming from a very, very poor community uh, in Poland. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go there. And you just think about, and this is the story of millions and millions of people. It's the story of your parents coming here, not knowing the language, with no money at all, uh, and, and becoming, becoming Americans. He was the proudest American you would you ever see. And I think the point is, what Peter is saying is to stress the common humanity of all of us. All of us want the good things for our children, whether you're black or you're white or whether you're Latino, whatever you may be. It's, the, it's pretty much the same thing. And I get so upset. You know, when Trump tries to divide us up, some uh, immigrant commits a crime and he just blasts, you know, these are the people committing crimes. But you got some white guy going to Las Vegas and shooting down dozens and dozens of Americans. Nothing to say about that. All right, so the point is we are all human beings, and we all have the same needs, and we got to stand up to people who are trying to divide us up for such superficial reasons as to the color of our skin or the language that we are speaking. And you got to open your heart, and, and our job is to bring us together. And then, you know, Peter said is right. You know, so many people came to this country not without struggle, not without struggle. I remember reading in this city in the 1920s, it was a big deal when a Catholic got a job at a bank. It's true. That was for Protestants. And it was a big deal when a Catholic got a job. And if you think the Italians and the Irish and the Jews and everybody else didn't have to struggle their way. Sure, well, well, Germans and the Japanese and the Asians, God knows, we have a history of that prejudice. But that's the struggle that we've been fighting for for hundreds of years. And in fact, in the last number of decades, we should be proud of the progress that we have made. This is the least discrimination discriminating, uh, discriminatory generation, your generation, in American history. And what bothers me, <laughs> and what bothers me so much about Trump is that he is trying to take us back where we were 50 years ago, and we gotta fight that. Okay, Gerhard. What does Germany do about affordable housing for uh, folks that are low income here in the United States? Um, we have millions of people who can't afford um, the, a decent, safe place uh, to live, and we have uh, growing homelessness all over the country. Um, and I know you've been asked to be an expert on so many different things about Germany, but uh, hopefully you can uh, talk a little bit about what Germany does about affordable housing and, and homeless, its homeless pop population. Thank you, Ehard. Well, affording housable is uh, key. Um, we have a shortage of um, a shortage of um, apartments and houses. And I just read in this coalition government of the next uh, government, uh, there is a new program of encouraging um, uh, homeowners or prospective homeowners. And there's a new program for um, social housing, and a couple of billions are being set of aside for that. Um, yes, uh, th th that is part of the quality of life, and I think um, it varies in, in Germany from city to city, from region to region. There are uh, well-to-do regions where there is no shortage of housing and where the housing is of good quality, and then there are uh, regions that are weaker, also structurally weaker, especially in the East still, uh, that is economically less thriving, generally speaking, than, than the West. It's still sort of the gap between East-West uh, uh, resulting from uh, the division of the country. Uh, yes, I, I can only uh, say that, that that's also part and parcel of a caring, uh, socially inspired and minded government that it sets funds aside for social housing, and I hope that is being done. So my name is Connor Snell, and I'm from Vermont. When you were a congressman, I actually got one of the scholarships to study abroad in Germany through AFS, the Congress Bundestag Scholarship. And just with both of you here, I wanted to thank you for that opportunity. Uh, it's inspired me to travel and learn new languages and teach abroad, and yeah, thank you. Hmm. Well, you're very welcome.
And I just want to add, I agree with what Peter said a few moments ago about the enormous importance of these type of programs that bring Americans abroad and, and people from Europe or any place uh, here into the United States. And maybe we can talk about how we can expand uh, some of those programs right here in Vermont. Uh, hello, um, my name is Stuart, and I have a question about vocational education in Germany for Ambassador Wittig. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you see any disadvantages uh, to putting students on either an academic or vocational track relatively early in their lives, and also um, if Germany does anything to keep the German education system from reinforcing class divisions, that is to say sort of channeling working class, people from working class families into working class professions and uh, sort of the opposite. I don't see that danger here as uh, sort of the separation, the continuing separation of classes um, because um, college, as I said before, is free and even um, the allowance for uh, the daily life uh, sort of the room and board um, is, is supported for lower income uh, families or children of lower income families. So college education is not a class bound anymore. But what is true is that there are kids, there are families that desire or that value practical skills over academic skills. And I think this, the society is moving in that direction, maybe overvaluing uh, academic skills and de uh, depreciating um, practical uh, industrial skills. Um, so I, I, I would say it's, it depends on, on, on the student, uh, on, on, on the young person where he or she sees the future. And by the way, the apprenticeship uh, system is not, uh, let's say, a fork in the road that um, decides your future life. You can go on from apprenticeship to college. That's what my daughter did. She did a two-year apprenticeship because she felt she was not ready for university and then went on to the university. And after college, uh, she had the edge over competitors uh, because she had done that apprenticeship and knew something about the practical side of life. So I think it's not a either or, sort of it can be complemented, the, the one with the other. I, I don't see a danger here of um, what you are getting at, sort of that a class structure is being sort of petrified uh, for the future. I don't think there is enough social uh, mobility potential uh, to uh, to ward off that danger. Okay, ma'am. Uh, my name is Erica Brown, and my question is: um, I am a writer, so communication and dialogue is really important. And I want to know your, um, I guess, like any words of advice you have for trying to talk to people who kind of shut out your opinions and ideals. Like, my uncle is conservative and I get a lot of, you're a snowflake and you're just a liberal. And so how do we combat sort of the echo chamber that forms when you surround yourself with people who think like you? And how do we reach out to people who might have differing opinions than we do? That is an excellent question. And I, I wish I could uh, give you a magical answer. The, the only thing that I, I, I would say, which I think is encouraging, is that on many, many areas of concern, there is far more agreement among the American people than the media allows you to believe. Now, there are some areas there are widespread disagreements, gun control, abortion. There are real divisions in American society. But on issues like um, raising the minimum wage, on issues like rebuilding our infrastructure and creating millions of jobs, on issues like demanding that the wealthy stop paying their fair share of taxes, on issues like making sure that every American is guaranteed health care, on all of those issues, pay equity for women, and more, on all of those issues. I'll give you another example, which really shocked me. I wouldn't have expected this. Should we provide legal status 
to the 800,000 plus dreamers. Do you know what the American people say? By 80%, 80% Republicans, Democrats, independents. So the starting point is to believe there are areas where there are really strong differences. Go to those areas where there is commonality. Uh, ask your uncle whether he thinks people should be working 40 hours a week and living in dismal poverty because they're making nine bucks an hour. Ask him whether health care should be a right of all people or not. Whether somebody, we heard a story, one of the first women up here tonight, in desperate shape because she can't afford her prescription drugs. Does he think that's right? Probably not. So start off in those areas where you think there is um, common interest and common views. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. S Senator Sanders and Ambassador Wittig, um, as I'm sure you both know, but maybe some people here don't, the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, also known as Rojava, is an oasis in the war-torn Middle East. It's a place where they've um, established democratic institutions, some of which can be directly traceable, actually, to the Vermont town meeting. They have taken in refugees far beyond proportions even that Germany has um, in Europe. They aspire to gender equality. They tr try to model ethnic inclusiveness um, and religious tolerance as a future, as a model for the rest of Syria, as a peaceful solution. Their military forces, the SDF, were the ones that finally defeated uh, ISIS in Raqqa. Now the westernmost canton of the Democratic Federation is under attack by Turkey, by the second largest um, military in NATO. With respect for the, um, the, the, the tiptoeing around Erdogan, who I believe has gone far from representing liberal values to become an actual Islamist autocrat who suppresses dissent, when will the United States government and when will the German government condemn the brutal invasion of Afrin, which is now hitting the city. Our civilians in, the, in Afrin city are now under attack by Turkey. Thank you. Well, you hit uh, certainly um, a, a very important, not only political, but humanitarian uh, conflict. And, and you know, in, in general terms, uh, Syria is the biggest humanitarian tragedy of our times. Uh, if you want to use that phrase, the international community has terribly failed uh, to resolve uh, the Syrian war. I think um, we have to apportion blame on a lot of countries here, uh, including our countries that you name. We were probably not robust enough uh, to uh, intervene, I'm not, I'm not meaning militarily intervene, but support those forces that were fighting for a um, free Syria. Um, on the other hand, I would not have a recipe, um, also in hindsight, um, to um, have resolved that ethnic, partially ethnic uh, civil war. I, s I was ambassador to Lebanon. I know the area pretty well. I was ambassador to the United Nations. I sat in the Security Council when the Syrian crisis broke out, and we tried our best to um, find a way of, of reconciliation before this conflict turned into a deadly ethnic conflict. Efrin, um, the region that you mentioned, is something that is a powder keg. Uh, it potentially pitches the, the U.S. against uh, Turkey. It's a very dangerous situation. Uh, we have um, appealed to Turkey to uh, moderate its, its reaction in, in not um, uh, hurting uh, the, the Kurds um, in, in northern Syria. Um, uh, in, in the end, um, I, I, I think that's an American-Turkish uh, conflict to resolve where we cannot, uh, we can only play a moderating role, but we cannot force uh, Turkey to do or not to do certain things. Uh, but I concede to you, um, we have, uh, we don't have a recipe for the Syrian crisis and we have uh, in a way allowed to uh, let this tragedy happen and it will be with us for with us for, for the next decades. 
One effect is that we have this million refugees. That's, that, that, that's a corollary of that war. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you and welcome to you, Ambassador Wittig. Um, I, I hope uh, your experience of Vermont is a stellar and sparkling experience. It's a fabulous place. Uh, thank uh, you. My uh, comment is actually to uh, Senator Sanders. Um, I've been a fierce and vigorous supporter of what you represent for at least a half a decade now, and I'm active with the Progressive Party, and I just really embrace everything. Uh, it's not just about you, really. It's uh, You really represent so many things that are are my heart, you know, and I, uh, and so I'm one of those people that is stepping up and, and, and getting actively involved, and it, it really annoys me because in, in my sense of reality, I should be calling you President Sanders right now. And that's what's true for me. And the fact is that I don't expect you to speak to campaign considerations or, or anything like that. I'm not looking to put you on the spot with regards to that sort of dynamic. What's also true, however, is there is so much writing on how we're being marketed to. I mean, it's ridiculous that, you know, we have such a negative uh, uh, opinion about taxes when, you know, we've, we've got this statesman from another uh, country on the planet, you know, where they, they get it, you know, so we're going to be responsible and pay taxes, you know, but look what we get for it and that sort of thing. So, we, instead of, anyway, what do, what, do, what do the next few uh, months and years look like to you? And, and, and I want to leave you with this challenge, if I may. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I leave this out here with all due respect. If you're not going to run again, are you grooming at least a half a dozen people? Beca <laughs> because, because the fact of the matter is I can't think of a statesman in this country besides you. Um, Thank you. I am not going to comment on 2020 <laughs> uh, because I think, as maybe the ambassador reminded us, in Germany your elections are three months, four months, four months, four months not four years, uh, three years. Um, right now, um, I am proud that out of our campaign came a, an organization called Our Revolution, uh, which is independent of me, but it came out of our campaign. And uh, I, perhaps right now or a week ago or a week to come, they had hundreds of people, mostly young people from every kind of background in Washington, D.C., over 400 people. You know what they were doing? They were training them to run for office. 400 people in Washington from school board to the United States Congress. So what I have been doing, I'm going to be going, uh, I don't know when, a week, two weeks to the Midwest, I'm going to the Southwest, to support progressive candidates uh, at every level, to get people involved. I think we are fighting, as we discussed a moment ago, we are at a pivotal moment in American history. And we have got to do and act in a way we have never acted before. I'm glad you're involved. Reach out to people all over this country. Right, we are taking on authoritarianism. We're taking on unbelievable sums of money. We can beat them if we are organized if we bring our people together, if we don't let Trump divide us up. So you'll have to trust me that I am working as hard as I humanly can uh, to achieve that goal. All right, uh, on that note, let me just, <laughs> let me, let me just, this is, uh, let me thank the ambassador. We have, he's never coming back to Vermont. We have worked him so hard <laughs> from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, because, you know, what we're doing tonight is coming together to talk about some of the most important issues that face our country and, in fact, the world. And uh, so I appreciate very much your coming out. And, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.